Be sure to download the note card you'll find in the video description, a link to the note card, and follow along with the lesson, fill it in. It'll be a record for you of what you have learned in this lesson from the Bible. And by all means, get your Bible. Go get your Bible. How many of you have a Bible? I always ask that question. I always like to see the Bible. So get your Bible. Follow along. And if you like this sermon, ring the bell. Also, uh, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Ring the bell to get a notification of when new content is added. If you want to follow us on social media, links to our social media account are in the video description. So now, let's jump into the sermon. Reconstructing the religious world of Abraham's day is difficult. First, based on the genealogy of Genesis chapter 11, Noah lived until Abraham was 58. Illustrate on this chart here. Shem lived 33 years after Abraham died. However, there were nine generations between Shem and Abraham. That is, Shem was Abraham's great, 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 great grandfather. Since we live in a time when only the long-lived few see their great-grandchildren, we can hardly know how much influence Shem or Noah would have had over Abraham. Yet I'm hard-pressed to think Jehovah God who caused the flood could have been completely forgotten while Noah and Shem lived. Their stories of the flood and their trip on the ark and how they knew to build it and be prepared must have been known and passed on. Yet sometime before Abraham, the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth were scattered at the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11. We really have no way to know what Abraham knew of Shem and Noah. With all this in mind, we read Joshua 24:2 to learn that Terah, Nahor, and Abraham served other gods. Of course, he was known by Abram at the time. We have no idea of what Abraham really knew of Jehovah when he was called. We have no idea exactly what Jehovah God did to call Abraham. We see no burning bush. We do not see generations of patriarchal training. We simply see a polytheist having been taken from his homeland by his father and then left in Haran when his father died. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, 32. At that point, Jehovah called Abraham to continue the trek Terah had started. For a man serving fake idols who never spoke, it must have been a shock to be called by the true God represented by no idol whatsoever. Yet Abraham listened. Talk about faith. From that point on, Abraham became the father of the faithful. He is the great example of faith for all time. Not all, not that his faith was perfect, but his faith allowed him to travel to Canaan, into Egypt, back to Canaan, and eventually to paradise. And we must not miss the implication that paradise in the story of Lazarus and the rich man is called Abraham's bosom. Luke chapter 16 and in verse 22. Most of us know the great story of Abraham. If you do not, I encourage you to read Genesis chapter 12 through 25. In this lesson, instead of following all his travels step by step, I want to examine the faith by which he traveled 
as is revealed in Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. Here's what it says. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundation, whose designer and builder is God. By faith. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. By faith, he looked beyond the temporal and the transient. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10 tells us, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. Abraham was fundamentally the same as us, surrounded by a canopy of error. One voice of truth called out to him. He followed. We are in the same situation. If we wish to travel to Abraham's bosom and then on to heaven, we must follow Abraham's footsteps of faith. And so let's examine these verses and learn how to travel by faith, as we look at Abraham, a traveler by faith. Again, our text, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, that we have just read. First of all, Abraham traveled by faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is not about Abraham. It's about faith. Everything these characters did, these 15 characters that are listed in the 11th chapter, everything they did, they did by faith. According to Hebrews 11 and verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This hope is not wishful thinking, but earnest expectation. Further, it is not earnest expectation that flows against the evidence. Rather, it is the earnest expectation based upon the Word of God. We have in Romans chapter 10 and in verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the Word of God. Abraham had received God's Word. He believed it. He didn't have to see anything. He merely had to hold on to God's Word. He had to see God's Word. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. He had not seen God according to Exodus chapter 6 and verse 3. Abraham did not even know God's name. He had simply received God's word and therefore put one foot in front of another no matter what kind of ground was before him. A wonderful illustration of this faith is seen in the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. While working his way through the secret passages to find the Holy Grail, Jones is stopped by a chasm without any particular means of crossing. He examines the notes his father had made in which a man walked by faith and not by sight across the gaping chasm. Believing his father's research, Jones lifts one foot in front of him, closes his eyes, and allows himself to fall forward. At the seemingly last moment, his foot found solid ground. Then we, the audience, are allowed to see the camouflage bridge. 
only after Jones crosses the bridge is he able to see with his eyes what he had done by faith. That was Abraham's journey. Repeatedly stepping out into the chasm because God said so and repeatedly finding a foothold just as God had promised. Abraham traveled by faith and so must we. Hebrews 11 and 6 explains without faith we cannot possibly please God until we are willing to hold God's hand, close our eyes, and step into the chasm, we are not fit to be God's servant. And then we find by faith, Abraham obeyed. We find for Abraham's faith was not a mental event. It was a very practical event. It impacted his daily life. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 does not merely say by faith. It says by faith, Abraham obeyed. If we stop with one point, as so many students of faith do, we will not really know what faith means. We will speak only of mental assent. However, for Abraham, faith was not a mental event. It was a very practical event. It impacted his daily life. And that is the key. Abraham's faith saved him not because he had faith, but because he had enough faith to do what God said. God said, leave Haran and travel to Canaan. Abraham obeyed. God said, let circumcision be a sign of our covenant. Abraham obeyed. Let your firstborn son Ishmael and his mother be cast away from you. Through Isaac your seed shall come. Abraham obeyed. God said, sacrifice your son Isaac on an altar. Abraham obeyed. When God says he will give us all things if we seek first his kingdom and righteousness, do we believe it enough to do that? Let us follow Abraham's footsteps and increase our faith in God to the point that we will surrender our lives to his will, obeying him when he says, take this step out into the chasm, I will keep you. Then, Abraham followed God without knowing the way. According to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, Abraham obeyed God by faith, even though he had no idea where he was going. Abraham didn't know anything about Cain. Further, he had no idea following God would lead him into Egypt. He had no idea it would lead him to do battle with five kings in order to rescue his nephew Lot. He had no idea when he would have children. He had no idea how many children he would have. He had no idea where his meals would come from once he got into camp. He had no idea how his family would be cared for. And keep in mind, this was not a bed of roses. He endured A famine while following God's directions, he simply knew that God had called him to travel this way, and he went. Further, he went with a willingness to go anywhere God told him, simply because God told him. Now, where will serving God take us? Some, in order to follow God, have to leave jobs. Some have to leave marriages. Some learn to stay in marriages that are troubled. Some lose friends. Some are ostracized by family. Some struggle with troubled congregational relationships. All of us at some point or or another go through famines in life. Don't misunderstand. The life of a Christian is not one of misery after another, one after another. There are plenty of good times and lots of blessings. However, following God is not always a walk in the park or, as they say, a cakewalk. 
Sometimes following God means laying down in green pastures, drinking from still waters. Other times it means walking through the valley of the shadow of death and eating in the presence of our enemies. Psalm 23. Whichever path we take, we must let God be our shepherd, allowing his rod and staff to comfort us. Whether we are eating the overflow of blessings, fleeing a famine, or suiting up for battle, we must follow God wherever he leads, and we must be willing right now to make that commitment. And that is the commitment of the Christian. We sing a song that says, where he leads, I will follow. Do we mean it? What if he leads us through trouble? What if he leads us through turmoil? What if he leads us through self-sacrifice? Are we willing to follow even though we don't know where God will lead us? Abraham was. Abraham did not waver when the promise was not fulfilled immediately. According to Hebrews 11 and verse 9, Abraham went to the land God promised to give him However, he lived there as a foreigner. He didn't get to live there as if it was his homeland. Not only that, he lived there in tents. Nobody lives on their own property in tents. Travelers, sojourners going from one place to another who are just passing through live in tents or today RVs, a motel on wheels. When you own your own land, you have your own home. You build your own house. When you run your own nation, you build cities and fortresses. However, Abraham spent his entire life in tents sojourning from one place to another. Hebrews 11 verse 13 explains what this means. Abraham had been given the promise, but the promise was really for his descendants. This land was his inheritance. However, he never really owned it. In fact, that didn't happen for hundreds of years until after the Egyptian captivity. Despite the fact that Abraham came to the promised land but really never received it, he continued in faith. Though he remained in his tent traveling from place to place, he still followed God's lead. So what about us? How well do we do that? If things don't go exactly the way we want in our timing, do we think of abandoning God? When we lose jobs, get sick, lose loved ones, endure hardship, undergo trial, do we think God has abandoned us and therefore think of abandoning him? Abraham didn't. Even though God was acting on his own timing and not in Abraham's timing, Abraham still followed God's lead by faith. The great example of that is illustrated in Hebrews 11 and verse 17, where it says, By faith, when Abraham was tested, offered of Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering of his only son. Though God had said his seed would come through Isaac, God now said, kill Isaac. Yet Abraham did not wait. He believed he could obey God, sacrifice Isaac, and God would still bring about his promise through Isaac's seed. What faith? What obedience? Now that is not to say Abraham never had struggles with his faith. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 19, God had said, Sarah would be the mother of Abraham's child of promise. However, in Genesis 20, when Abraham traveled into the land of Abimelech, Abraham lied about his relationship with Sarah, according to verse 11. Abraham said it was because he feared for his life. Well, what about God's promise? God's promise did not allow for Abraham to be killed yet. Here, I think, is a great comfort for us. Sometimes we also struggle with our faith. However, one of our greatest heroes of faith faced the same struggles that we faced and came out in the end. Faith is a growth process. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and verse 8 
for this very reason, make every effort to submit, supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge. And he goes on there, but then watch what he says in verse 8. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, starting with faith. Abraham faced these struggles, but still made it into the chapter of faith. Despite our struggles, when we grow in faith, we will be justified by God just as Abraham was. We must, however, not be turned aside just because God does not fulfill his promise in our timing. We must continue on in faith and allow God to pursue his own timetable. As the song we sing based on Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 says, God makes all things beautiful in his time. Abraham traveled because he could envision that city that was coming. He was able to see the city built by God. I believe this verse has dual meaning. Abraham lived in tents, but he was able to see by faith in God's promise the day when God built the cities with foundation for Abraham's descendants. Did he know exactly what Jerusalem would look like? I doubt it. Did he know exactly where it would be? Probably not. However, he knew God's promise, and while he dwelt in a tent, he could see God's city. Notice. Psalm 87, verse 1, On the holy mount stands the city he found. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Further meaning revealed in Hebrews eleven sixteen, Abraham was more interested in a heavenly city than an earthly one. It says, as it is, they desire a better country that is the heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. It is hard to travel by faith if we are bogged down by what we see. As Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2 says, we must not be focused on the things below, but on the things above. As Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 says, we must put our value on things down here, not put it on things down here, but the value on spiritual things of heaven. Only then. As Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21 points out, we must not put our value on things down here, but we must value the, the spiritual things of heaven. Only then can we walk by faith. We must see the city God is preparing. We must envision where we are going in eternity. Only then can we walk with our eyes closed down here. Only then can we faithfully step out into the chasm where God directs us if we are too worried about preserving persevering, uh, preserving, da, 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 da. I'll get it in a minute. Only then can we faithfully step out into the chasms where God directs us. If we are too worried about preserving what we have here, we will never make it. That is why it is so important to overcome materialism and covetousness. We simply can't walk by faith if our heart is divided between God and earthly things. Don't allow your physical eye to obscure your spiritual eye. Abraham was to, able to envision the heavenly city of God. Can we meditate on God's heavenly city? look forward to it, value it above all else, and this walk of faith with Abraham and God will come naturally. One of my favorite stories of all times is The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. 
I know not everyone agrees with me. I've heard several reasons why other people didn't like those books. And one of the most amazing, however, was from two separate people who claimed the same reason. They said the story just seemed like a cheap copy of other fantasy literature they had read. And what's amazing, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are the original fantasy stories. Every other fantasy story written has been so in the wake of J.R.R. Tolkien's originality and creativity. And that's really like our lives and Abraham's. Too easily we can look back at Abraham's life and see it through colored glasses or rose colored glasses of our lives. However, Abraham is the original. He is the example. He has blazed the trail for us to follow in his footsteps and walk by faith. We must never view Abraham's life as an imitation of ours. Rather, we must let our lives be an imitation of his traveling to the heavenly city by faith, obeying God, though we have no idea where he will lead and maintaining faithfulness as we wait on his timing that is walking by faith and not by sight. Abraham did it. So can we. Bob's your uncle. What must I do to be saved? We learn the action is we must hear. Faith comes from hearing, hearing through the word of God. We must hear God like Abraham heard the voice of God. We must hear God. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. He said, it is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, Jesus said, comes to me. In Acts 15, 7, after much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please God, for whoever would be drawn near to God must believe that he exists. He rewards those who seek him. John 20, verse 31, these are written, these things that John wrote, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Important. Repentance. Luke 13, 3 and 5 said, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, 30, Paul said. 2 Corinthians 7, and in verse 10, how important. Notice verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. He tells us in that passage. 2 Peter chapter 3, and in verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Jesus said, Whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who's in heaven. Then we learn if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 8, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, also will acknowledge him before the angels of heaven. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Timothy was told, take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession. We must make the good confession. Be baptized for the remission of our sins. Where as many of you as were baptized into Christ, they put on Christ. Galatians 3, 27. Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. 
Mark 16, 16. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And then we learn it's a burial, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Endure to the end. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake, Jesus said, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Revelation 2.10 Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for ten days of tribulation. Be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life. Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, if you found this video helpful and want to learn more, be sure to download the note card that goes with this lesson and our free Bible correspondence. You'll find the links in the description below. And so we invite you to do that. Now, thanks for watching or listening. And we here at the Spring Hill Church of Christ want to help you with your growth in the knowledge of God's Word. Remember, we are in it for the likes and the subs, so be sure to subscribe. If you're in the area, be sure to meet with us at one of these times posted. Sunday morning Bible study where we studied not just study about the Bible, but we studied the Bible, 945. Sunday a.m. service, 1035. Sunday afternoon service, 4 p.m. Wednesday evening Bible study, 6.30 p.m. Thanks for watching or listening. And remember, in the meantime, in between time, see you next time. Cheerio, Bob Jerome.